My name is Clara and uh, you're here for a live tour of the Atlas Cavern. So before we get started, I want to check that you can hear me okay. Um, so I've got my microphone on, so if folks in the, in the chat can just let me know that you can hear me okay, and then we can get dive right into this live. Also, uh, let me know where you're joining from, so I can see that someone's already joining from Germany and also from Oklahoma, so welcome. Uh, it would be great to, to hear or to see in the chat where you're joining from. Uh, and let me know if you've joined a live before or if this is one of the first lives uh, on this channel that you've joined. So, uh, yep, Alan says that you can hear us. And also I see Bob in the chat. Thank you so much for joining again. So yes, uh, Bob is from Fundamentally Explained and he has an excellent channel making physics videos. So you should definitely go and check them out. And he is so kind to join these chats and moderate while we do these lives. So I'm also joined with my colleague, uh, colleague Joni today. So if you want to come here and I'm going to turn the camera around. Aha, magic. So you should also be able to hear Joni. Okay. So do you want to say hi and yep. then we'll check also that the mic is okay. working. So hi everyone, could you hear me well? Uh, uh, so. Yeah, just yep. keep talking and okay. we'll, yeah. Hi, um, my name is Joni and I'm a physicist from the Center of Dark Matter from University of Melbourne in Australia. Um, and I work for the Atlas experiment here, so I get involved in many different activities and projects. I work for the um, uh, heavy iron their analysis at Atlas, uh, run operation, and I'm also engaged in some uh, education and um, communication activities uh, at CERN Science Gateway. So, yeah, welcome to the Atlas uh, cavern today. Excellent. So maybe since we're already pointing the camera at you, uh, do you want to explain where we are and what we can see behind us? And I'm going to show everybody up uh, what we're looking at. Okay, so we are at the cavern and we are at like the lowest level of the cavern of the Atlas experiment. So um, we are almost 100 meters underground and you can see behind me is a giant called Atlas. Uh, and yeah, so Atlas may, you know, remind you of um, a giant from the myth, uh, the mythology of Greeks, but here we have a machine, it's a detector, and it's really huge. So uh, it's basically like a cylinder um, with the diameter uh, 25 meters and the, the length of 15 meters. The weight in total is around 7,000 tons, which is like equivalent to the weight of um, the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Uh, and what does the Atlas detector do. So maybe, first of all, I would like to step back a little bit um, to tell you what, what a detector does. Uh, because maybe some of you may not um, you know, be so used to the term detector in physics, but you may be familiar of a detective as like Detective Sherlock Holmes, right? Um, and basically what Sherlock Holmes does is like if a crime um, occur, and then you know the police would call Sherlock Holmes for help. Sherlock Holmes didn't witness the crime, didn't know who the culprit was, but Sherlock Holmes can look for the traces that the culprit leaves behind and analyze the traces. Then he can reconstruct the image of the culprit and bring them into light. So basically, what our particle detector does is to um, is is doing like the work of Sherlock Holmes. We look at the traces that the particle leave behind after the collisions. And for the traces, we try to work out what kind of particle that is. So we identify the culprit. We reconstruct the image of the culprit and then we bring them into light. But I won't give the detail yet. Um, so that just a brief introduction about the particle detectors. And for all the information we gather, we would like to understand what are the physical processes that happen, um, you know, like after the particle collision. Yeah. Perfect. So maybe we can begin with our journey yeah. through the detector. Yep. So uh, as Johnny just said, this is our Sherlock Holmes uh, detector or detective. So we're starting right now uh, on the very lowest level. So we're 100 meters underground. Um, so we're starting at the very bottom showing you this huge detector. Which way do you want to go? So maybe like, we can go up this way. Sure, yeah. So we're going to take you upstairs and have a look from a different angle. So I can see that there are some questions in the chat. We're going to come to some questions a bit later. 
Um, just to let Bob know, I have no access to a Google Doc, so that's why I didn't send you a link or anything. Um, so I'm just going to keep a lookout for the questions, but maybe people can repeat them a bit later so that we can get to the, the questions. But first, we're going to go on a wander yeah. and uh, explain yeah. how things work. I do. Do you want to explain the bottle now or when we talk about the LHC? Um, maybe when we talk about LHC. Okay, yeah. perfect. So let's turn the camera around so you can see us as we go on a walk. Yeah. So we're uh, <laughs> walking through the cavern now. Um, so I must say, I absolutely love being underground. And the only reason that we can be here right now is because the Large Hadron Collider is off. So uh, that's, it's not currently running, just in case anybody, uh, anybody has that question. So you want to go so, up the stairs? Yeah, I can walk yeah. yeah. So we'll turn the camera around. I'm going to try and hold it as uh, steady as possible, this camera, but also don't have one of those gimbals, so hopefully the video is coming across nice and clear for you. Um, we do have Wi-Fi down here, which is fantastic, so we always get a good signal. So as you can see, we're really in the heart of the cavern, and we can get right up close to the detector, but that's our sign that says no touching because it is a very delicate piece of equipment. Yeah. Do you want to go here? Um, up to you, where yeah, you yeah. want to stop, yeah. We're going to have a look at every single floor so people can uh, get a look at this detector. Maybe, yeah, I guess we want to avoid this side. Yeah. Uh, sure. Just so to let you know, because there are also other tours that come into the cavern, so some people are able to visit the detector in person but these all get snapped up very quickly, which is why we're showing you also uh, virtually this cavern. So I see more people joining from different places. So we have someone from Nigeria uh, and somebody's joining from Spain and from the UK, from the US, from India. So welcome to everyone. Thanks so much for joining this tour. Uh, if you've just joined now, then we, uh, we've just gone from the the lowest floor and we're climbing up the stairs, up the detector. So maybe we can show. Yeah? You can, do you want to say what we're seeing? So basically this is the beam pipe, right? So where the uh, the beams of protons that I would go um, to for the collision. But we'll talk about it in a minute. Yeah. So now you just enjoy the view. So this is a spoiler that this is the Large Hadron Collider that we can see. So we walk for quite a bit, right? It's got to be tiring for us because it's like 11 floor here, yeah. 11 level. And we're on the third one now? Yeah, yeah we're on the third now floor. We're at the third. Yes. So the nice thing about these virtual tours is we can really show you up and close with the detector. So you can see one of the cables that connect the detector. So this is for powering, this is for reading out the electrical signals but we'll get to all that in a bit so uh we're going to keep going up maybe we can go um yes. we're going to pass floor. yeah so you want to take the uh well but with the elevator uh, we may lose the signal yeah i can't go in so. the lift with the phone it's okay so we can walk yeah yeah let's turn this around so you can also yeah. see us so we're just gonna skip this floor because there's a yeah. So on the fl uh, this floor, we have some visitors visiting the um, Atlas experiment right now. And if you visit us in person, then you are limited to one of the corridors right there. But if you visit virtually, then basically you are shown, you know, like every single corner. Yeah. So you have an advantage. So you see, no visitors here. But that doesn't mean you. It doesn't mean us. Yeah. So yes, yeah, sometimes we get asked about whether or not people are allowed to see behind the scenes at CERN. And uh, yeah, absolutely. So again. So now we're at the top of the Large Hadron Collider. So essentially we're halfway up the detector. That's how far we've climbed so far. We're gonna yeah. keep going. Yes. One more floor. And then we should be. So the sixth floor would be the best view in my opinion. So you want to go left or right? Maybe uh, let's go, way. yeah, let's go this way. Oops. 
So if you can hear rattling, by the way, that's my uh, dosimeter and my identification badge. Uh, so the one thing about, let's keep going, because yep. I don't want to sure. point yeah. the camera that way. Not because it's anything secret. Oh no, it's okay, it's fine. I just want to preserve people's privacy. But uh, we can't see them, so that's perfect. Yep. Tim says be careful on the steps, so we were very careful, but thank you so much. So yeah, now you get a really great view of the detector from this side. Can I zoom out? No, I can't. Okay, so do we want to talk here about the LHC? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Do you want to you can okay. talk and then I'll add in? Yeah. So um, first of all, um, when we, um, yeah, because like, we want to start our story with the story of the Large Hadron Collider. So a lot of you may have heard about the Large Hadron Collider. It's like our biggest, the superstar of CERN. It is a ring accelerator with the, um, yeah, the length, the circumference is about 37 kilometers. So it's really large. And a majority part of the Large Hadron Collider is on the French side and part of it is on the Swiss side, so it is located on both the countries. So it's across the country, across the border, which is really exciting. And uh, also another important feature of the Latin Collider is that it is 100 meters underground. So basically like where we are standing right now, yeah, about 100 meters uh, below the surface. And the story begins you... with a border. Yeah, as you're saying that, I'm just going to show them. Oh, it's a bit hard to see the surface from here. But yeah, that... maybe later when we are on level 11. Yeah, so then we we'll look up. Show that more. So, I'm so excited to show you this new bottle of water that I just bought. And basically, this represents so it's a replica of the bottle of hydrogen gas that we use here at CERN. And this is where the story begins. So, the story begins with just a bottle of hydrogen gas, just small like this. And could you believe that this bottle could supply? the protons for the Large Hadron Collider for 200,000 years of operation. And I'm not kidding. And yeah, it's real. Like you can find this from the science, uh, from the science gateway shop. It's so, so tiny. <laughs> yeah. But there's so many protons in one tiny bottle. Yeah, well, you can do also the math, right? If you don't believe me, like for every mole of hydrogen gas, two gram, that would be about 10 to the 24 atoms and every second we would need about 10 to 11 uh, uh, protons so basically that it can last us for like several several seconds yeah so yeah. basically like 200,000 um, years um, of protons can be contained in such a model so the hydrogen gas is then injected injected into um, a device called duoplasmatron that's so inside, my favorite word here so yeah. the duoplasmatron is such a yeah. great word <laughs> and inside, inside it, um, there is a high voltage, a very, very high voltage that heats up the gas and ionizes the gas. Basically, like they strip off all the electrons from uh, the atoms, and now we are left with only protons. The protons would be then injected into the linear accelerator, and then to the booster, and then the proton zeotron, the super proton zeotron, and then finally to the large hadron collider. So yeah, I don't expect that you would remember like all the details, but all you need to know is that it's a long way for the protons from the bottle to, um, you know, like to be ready to be injected into the Large Hadron Collider. So it's a long process. Yeah. So I'm just going to add in uh, from that. So the proton synchrotron was built in the. Oh, that's, that's so much better. Uh, the proton synchrotron was built in the 50s and the super proton synchrotron was built in the 70s. So these are accelerators that we built in the past to do studies here at CERN. They uh, made some fantastic discoveries by themselves. And then in order to then be able to fill in the LHC with high energy protons, we use them to get to the LHC. So we're always reusing the technology that we have here at CERN and not deconstructing it and building something completely brand new. So we're, we're using these uh, accelerators that were already built before to do studies and then they get added into that accelerator chain to accelerate the protons. And I would say that uh, it takes a long way, right, like from the dual plasmatron to the large hadron collider. And do you remember exactly how long does it take? 
think about. Well, it takes about an. Are you mean in time? It takes about an hour to fill the electricity. Yeah, I think like about an hour, two hours, something like that. But, yeah. And yeah, until we get like the physics beam, and like, we can start to have like collision. So yeah, like because like we work, like we both work in the front, um, so in the control room, and uh, we could kind of keep track of you know like the path of the protons like that. We had to monitor it, and uh, yeah, like sometimes it takes us like hours to start to get the collision. So there are a lot of work to do, and yeah, finally. When the protons are um, entering the Large Hadron Collider, so they also get accelerated, and yeah, then there's no collision yet until that some uh, condition satisfy. So first, they need to get like the right energy, as uh, like seven tera electron volt, and the right speed, right? Like um, they have to reach the speed of almost the speed of light, like 99.996% the speed of light, something like that. And then they're ready to collide with each other. And here are where, so basically, so not exactly here, but somewhere inside, right in the center. That way. Yeah, the center of um, the detector, that's where the collision happens. And the detectors here, basically, like, they are like the set of traps to make the collision, like to make the particles from the collision leave the traces so that we can collect the traces and from there we can reconstruct the image or like the path, the trace uh, of um, the particles. And then we try to understand what are the physical processes behind. Yeah. So maybe we should just say at this point, so this isn't how the detector is when it's actually running. So right now, because we're during shutdown, then we have opened up part of the detector and the technicians and engineers and physicists are going into the detector to maybe change a few cables or do some very, very minor repairs. I always say that we're very lucky yeah. uh, here at CERN because our detector, uh, we can come down during these shutdowns to yes. do repairs. Whereas if, uh, yes. if you send a satellite into space, mm -hmm. then unfortunately, uh, once it's up there, except for the Hubble, which was able to get um, a team sent to it, it's just got to work, yeah. and if it doesn't work, then uh, then it's it's kind of gone. But uh, yeah, we can use these opportunities when the LHC isn't running to come underground. And so then when we do run, um, this detector that you see here, which we'll explain more about it uh, in a bit, uh, that will get pushed back into place. This magnet, which again we'll talk about uh, in a minute to explain what it is, that'll get pushed into place. And then one of these giant wheels that you can see, and again, we'll explain more about yes. that in a moment, um, it actually, and let me tilt the phone down without dropping it, it'll get taken all the way across this floor, and it also goes flush with this side of the detector. But there's actually two there, there's another one behind it. And so the other one is gonna stay there, and that really helps us with these traces that Johnny was talking about, about being able to uh, track where the particles have gone. So, do we want to go on a bit more of a walk and then we'll sure. talk about yes. how sure. how the detector is constructed. And by the way, we are on the C side, right? Mm -hmm. Is it A or C? Great question. I think it's A, yeah. It's yeah. A. So basically we call A and C because like A signifies the airport. So this is the direction to the airport. Yeah, that's And correct. that one is the like direction towards CERN. So we have the A side and the C side and they are about 15 meters apart. Yeah, so just to tell you like, you know, how big it is. Yeah, so yeah. what you'll see in a minute when we go to the other side is may maybe the, I don't know if the magnet is out on that side, but generally we have a symmetrical view from each side because we try to make, because as we said, the collision point is over here, and we try to make the detector symmetrical around that point so that, because the particles come up in all directions, we want to be able to measure as much as possible. So again, as we said earlier, you're getting to see parts of this uh, cavern and this experimental hall that isn't usually visible on, a, on an in-person tour. So these are my favorite pipes. Every time I pass these pipes, I don't know what they do. I think it's something to do with the gases. Uh, they do have labels, but I just think they look really steampunk and uh, I really like them. Yeah. So I did see one question about um, how do we stop the LHC from getting dusty? So that's actually, it's a really great question. The Sorry, short can answer. Hear the question again? Uh, so they were asking, how do we stop the LHC from getting dusty? 
uh, like getting dust in it. Oh. Uh, so, well, I was, uh, the short answer is it's a vacuum. So we don't, we, we take all of the air out of the vacuum pipe and therefore uh, we don't, oh yeah, so the magnet is out. We don't get dust in, but little bits of dust do get into the, into the pipe and there are, we have ways of removing that but it's very very small pieces and we don't have to worry about it so now we're on the other side of the detector and you can see that it's now symmetrical uh, so we're, we've got a very similar view that we had before but now we're on the other side of the detector so i'll quickly explain uh the main components of the detector and then we can uh, talk more about how each of the parts work. So uh, let's turn that round. I'm gonna come with the, my base is a bit pink because it's minus eight degrees outside. So uh, I'm gonna stand here so you can see the detector. So behind me, we have this Atlas detector. So the main three sub components that we have of this detector are we have the um, tracking, or maybe if I give you the camera, there's a lot of cables, sorry. Okay. So I turn the camera around. Can okay. you face it this way? Uh -oh. Then it's good. then I'm not okay. like super close. Yep. So um, yeah, so we have three main sub detectors for the Atlas experiment. So the first one is called the tracking detector. So as was explained before, and we were looking for the traces of the particles. This is the main sub detector that's doing that job. It's tracking charged particles that come from the center of the collision. And it's the part of the detector closest to that collision point. And so we're very accurately trying to track where these particles have gone uh, and also work out their uh, charge and their momentum. Um, and this is really important for identifying which particles have passed through. And then the next layer and uh, part of our sort of uh, information gathering, you know, the, the description with the Sherlock Holmes at the beginning, if you're gathering evidence to work out which particles have gone through. The next part is called the calorimeters. So the best way to know the job of the calorimeters is to think of the word calories. Uh, and this tells you how much energy you're getting from your food. Specifically, it's to do with heat, but really we think of the energy that's coming from our food. And so the calorimeters tell us how much energy the particles have. And uh, there are two types of these calorimeters and they do that by stopping the particles, by slowing them down with a very dense material. And then we put a detecting material in the way. And so it gathers the electrical charges that come from these particles being stopped. And then we can gather that electrical charge and we can look at the shape that the particles have left in the detector and this tells us also about how much energy they have and then as far as we know so far from our recipe book and we haven't talked too much yet about the types of particles but from the particles that we've discovered so far the two types of particles that are left over after we've passed the calorimeter are the muons and these are the heavier cousins of electrons and also the neutrinos now the neutrinos, unfortunately, we just can't measure at all um, because they don't interact with any part of our detector. In order to be able to measure neutrinos, you need even bigger detecting materials. And so in that case, we're using ice in Antarctica or we're using the Mediterranean Sea. And it's really kilometers of detecting material in order to be able to measure those neutrinos. So here we just don't have that facility. So we have to infer where they've gone from the missing momentum in our detector. So we work out where the stuff, the particles should have gone, and then we can see where it's missing and we can say that the neutrinos have gone that way. Uh, but then the muons, which I also mentioned, these are the heavier cousins of electrons, and they are detected with this part of the detector called the muon spectrometer. So this whole section, this giant wheel, is just for measuring muons. And muons are really interesting in our results because they're very clean signatures. They leave very uh, nice tracks through our detector. And so seeing muons already tells us that it was an interesting event because unfortunately we can't keep every single 
collision that happens in the detector in terms of reading out the data. So we have to make very quick decisions with the hardware that we install and some software algorithms to decide which particles we're going to keep, and the muons really help with that. Um, we also, you can see here, this copper section in the heart of the detector, so just to the left of the magnet, sorry. Uh, so this is a, a smaller version of this wheel you just saw on the right. We're not very good at naming things. We called it, it's, it's a small wheel, small muon wheel, and it's the new version because we installed a new version. So we named it the new small wheel. Um, but it was a huge operation a couple years ago to install this, and it, it enables us to better measure muons. So I'm just going to point with my finger. It's this section here uh, in the image. So those are the main parts. And then we also have um, a, a solenoid magnet, which you can't see. It's very close to the tracking detector. So that's in the heart of the detector over here. Not, But then we also have a toroid magnet. So that's this orange and gray section, which is a super conducting magnet. Uh, and it gives us a very high magnetic field. And that is what enables us to measure the charge, the electrical charge of the particles. And so this section also, this uh, metal structure, is part of that toroid magnet system. It's the end cap. And um, so it kind of finishes the field lines of the magnet in order to keep all of the magnetic field uh, nice and contained within the detector. It's a very clean setup. So I think, uh, yeah, that's a run through of the different subcomponents. You want to add anything? To yeah, so I have uh, a few information that I can add. So first of all, um, about a tractor. And again, like you may think that like the technology that we use here is like super, super uh, technology that like only exists in sci-fi movies. But in fact, you know, like every one of you, I believe that own um, a detector at home, like a particle detector. And I have also one with me in my pocket. This one. Hey. Yeah. yeah. So your phone, believe it or not, is also a particle detector. But like if you ever ask yourself, like, how the phone can do, you know, like the image recognition, uh, recognition, you know, the facial recognition and unlock, um, you know, like, um, by, you know, like just looking at the face. So the reason why your phone can do that, and in case that, you know, someone may uh, steal your phone and steal, a, a, you know, an image of you, a photo of you and put it in front, but the phone is smart enough to recognize that it's just a picture. So the way they do it is like this. So they shoot a beam of photons. So it's like the particles of light to your face and then the particles will be reflected back to the phone. So they will do the reconstruction of the 3D, three-dimensional image of your face thanks to the silicon sensor in the phone. And the silicon sensor are also used a lot in our trackers here. So basically, we have like multiple layers of silicon sensors. And whenever there is a particle pass through the sensor, then it will ionize the atom. And then the electrons will be stripped off, right? And all the electrons will be pushed to one side thanks to the, magnetic, sorry, the electric field that we provide is like, uh, you know, in the capacitor. So then, you know, like the electrons from the ionization will create an electric um, uh, current. And this is something that we can measure. So we know that there's a particle passing through. And then if we could connect the dot, you know, where the particle hits the silicon sensor, then we can recreate, you know, the track so we know where the cupid is going. And then we can bring them into life in case that you didn't realize the pun that I made earlier. So when Clara talked about the um, uh, calorimeters, so some, some part of a calorimeter is made of a very special um, material, it's like lead and tungsten. So they can bring the light, um, the UV light that we cannot see with our naked eyes mm -hmm. to visible light. And yeah, they could be very bright blue light, very beautiful. And yeah, therefore, like we can also, you know, with the help of the photo multiplier, so we can measure basically the current, uh, the, the intensity, and then we, we can measure like how much energy 
that the particle deposit through those layers. So basically, our uh, our job here at the Atlas detector is to bring something invisible to the naked eyes to something that the computers, not us, but the computers can measure. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Also, it's really interesting what you say about the detector in the phone. I just found out my phone can measure the temperature of things. Yes. So I can point it at something and it will tell me how hot my cup of tea is. Oh, wow. Which That's I, cool. I just found out. Maybe it's been there for a long time, but I thought it was very cool. Yeah. <laughs> and also, this is very good. Like, um, it, you can check with your phone, maybe not with iPhone, but uh, with Android phones and like any other phone that it can detect UV light, sorry, not UV, infrared light very well. Ah. So you can try with the remote control at home. So you, you know, like, there's a, a small, a tiny light bulb in front of the remote control, right? And you never saw that it light up any time that you try to press and um, yeah, maybe like a lot of you may think that like it's just broken, but no, it's just, uh, you know, like just eject like very low um, energy like in the infrared region and your phone can detect that. So basically your phone is a very good particle detector. Unfortunately, it only recognizes one type of particle, which is photon, whereas our tracker here mm -hmm. can detect many uh, different type of particles and can also find more information like um, energy, momentum, uh, and yeah, many other uh, things. So um, from all the information we gather, then we can find out what the culprit would be and then we predict like the um, physical processes, like you know, from experimental result to theoretical result and then like we try to compare. Yeah. yeah. So that's how we do it. So Tom is asking if Android phones also detect infrared, and I'm pretty sure yes, because yes, Android, I think that's yes. how my yeah. phone is measuring the temperature. Yes, I think that only iPhone that doesn't do it. Well. Ah, so it's yes. the iPhone that doesn't yeah. do it. Ah. But, you know, like, the audience can check it themselves, you know, like, you just, uh, you know, with the remote control that, you know, you press some button, and then, like, you put um, the camera, so you turn on the camera of your phone mm -hmm. in front of the remote control, and you can check it. Excellent. Yeah. Great, so do we want to go any higher? Sure. Or yeah, of course. Do we want to do it on that side or this side? We can side? like go like in a circle. Oh yeah, we're yeah. going to go on a, on a walk. So you're really getting the, the full tour. I love these pipes. Again, they look really steampunk to me. I just, uh, it's one of the nice things about really being able to come behind the scenes and around the back of the detector. So let's turn this around and then we can uh, Say hi. Oh, thank you. So we're walking around the, the detector. So we're doing a full tour. So you're now going to see the same view, but from the other side. So you can really see how symmetrical it is. Anyone who was worried about the phones being over the edge, here we have netting. Uh, not everywhere, but we also hold on to them very tightly. So uh, my phone is very precious to me, so I am not dropping it. Also with this phone, you can't see it, but I'm holding it in a, in a tripod vise. So uh, it's very, very well gripped. Um, so let's turn it around this way. So we're now, so we were over there a minute ago and we've come all the way around the back of this detector. And now we're on this side so we can really see inside the detector there. So we can't see the very heart of the detector because it is enclosed over here. So we're gonna walk this way and we'll try and get about halfway uh, and see the detector there. So there's a question in the chat that's asking uh, how long I've worked at CERN. So I've been working at CERN. This year is gonna be my 15th year of working at CERN. Um, so I started in 2009 as a PhD student so uh, I've worked for many different universities in that time, but always with the Atlas experiment. So uh, that's very exciting. You're when did so you? Loyal. <laughs> very loyal, yeah. Yeah. When did you uh, join Atlas? So I joined Atlas in 2016. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Also the University of Melbourne. Yeah. But I have a very different background. So I didn't start with particle physics. Uh, I was doing atomic physics for my master actually. Ah. Yeah. And yeah. So. So I let's uh, hold on then. Oh, hold on, I'm trying to turn the camera around. So then what made you change to particle physics from atomic physics? Well, I mean, I was always passionate uh, about particle physics. Uh, 
Um, in fact, I, I often told this story, it was very funny. Because like when I was in high school, like the last year of high school, so once my teacher just asked us a question, like just look at um, this equation, like, um, you know, like uh, gravitational force and then uh, electric force, magnetic force. You see that like they have like a common form. So basically the force is inversely proportional to the distance square. So he said that like, do you think that like they may, you know, originate from the same source? So maybe, you know, like uh, there is a unified theory of these three forces. And we, we know that there's already, you know, electromagnetic force, we already unify them. What about gravity? What about strong and weak force? And at that time, like, I misunderstood his question. I thought that it was, you know, like um, the question, uh, like the whole world question. So I, I came home and then I tried to uh, read about that. So I read the book, um, A Brief History of Time mm -hmm. and the Universe in a Nutshell by Stephen Hawking. And that was the first time that I heard about CERN, about the Large Hadron Collider. At, at that time, yeah, um, it just started, yeah. And I got very passionate and I really wanted, like, it was my dream to be able to visit CERN to see the Large Hadron Collider and yeah, so the dream come true, like now I'm here at the Atlas uh, Detector, so it has always been my dream. Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, we're still walking along the inside. Oh, let's have a look at these uh, very cool tanks. So we do use gas uh, for cooling and for measurements in our detector. So this one is holding argon. So we, one of those calorimeters I was talking about is the liquid argon calorimeter. So it needs argon to be able to do its job. So we have tanks of it back here. And then we also use uh, nitrogen and carbon dioxide uh, mainly for cooling. So a lot of these pipes are either transporting those gases that we need. Uh, we have helium. So liquid helium is used to cool the superconducting magnets. Um, so now we're back on the other side of the detector. So before, again, we were over on that side. So you can really see sort of the structure of the detector from walking around it. So Jack, I'm using a Pixel phone, Google Pixel. So it's an eight. Uh, and I'm very happy because the camera is very good. Uh, but unfortunately, I had to. My phone broke, which is why it's a. Uh, it's the new Pixel. So we're really getting you lots of views of this detector. So you can see here, there's a sign about uh, harnesses. So very occasionally, people have to uh, use harnesses to come down and access parts of the detector. It's something I've always wanted to train for. <laughs> but it's not, my, my job is to analyze the data, so unfortunately it's not my job, but uh, if anybody wants to let me like abseil down into a cabin somewhere, that'd be super cool. Okay, so we're gonna keep going up uh, and we'll show you the detector from above. So we've got more of these stairs. Um, So we're going to keep going. So we're at level seven now. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to keep climbing these stairs. So soon we'll get to the top and then we can answer some more questions. I see that there's more coming in in the chat. So we've, we're now on the ninth floor. So we have to go a slightly different direction. Okay. Up to 12? Yep. Okay. So that was 10. 10. So if you can see that one, let's turn it around. Yeah, so there's a comment about a pretty good workout. This is my second time climbing these stairs today. So my step counter is going to be very happy with me. Um, so we're going to stop here because there's a yeah. there's some testing device up there. Yeah. So maybe now you can show 
like the path where all the material is worked out. Uh, Maybe you have to use like, the front camera. Yes, uh, yeah. I am using the front camera. Uh, but yeah. uh, okay. I just wasn't tilting it correctly. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, so it's imagine that you are a piece of equipment and you have to be brought down. You cannot be brought down by the elevator. Sorry, I'm a bit out of breath here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so maybe just to say, because this detector is huge, as Johnny was saying earlier, so it's yeah about 46, 50 meters long, um, and it's 25 meters wide. And so this uh, shaft up to the, that, so that's up there is, that's ground level. Um, and it's about uh, maybe 20 meters wide or something like that. But anyway, it's, the detector is wider than the shaft is and also you need to have some space for these pipes and you don't want to damage any of your equipment so we lower the pieces down partially constructed and then they are finally installed into the cavern after after they're lowered in so there are some fantastic pictures of the construction of the atlas experiment and if you want to see those then the official atlas uh, instagram account is brilliant for, I mean, it's brilliant anyway, but it's brilliant for sharing these historical pictures because one of the folks that's working on the account just absolutely loves to go into a deep dive of all of the historical photos that we have at CERN. So you should definitely be checking out the official Instagram for Atlas and looking at all of the amazing photos, uh, both historically and uh, recently as well. So, uh, yeah, what, what were you wanting to say about the... Yeah. Um, in fact, right, there's a reason not, not one, but like there are many reasons why like we build this uh, detector, um, you know, like 100 meters underground. I mean, of course, like, it would save a lot more, right, if we do it on the surface. Unfortunately, there are reasons. For example, first of all, safety issues, right? So when the machine is on, the level of radiation is really high, yeah. and we are not allowed to go down. I mean, even us, you know, physicists, like we monitor from the surface, uh, and uh, yes, at some point that um, yeah, at some point that when it's safe enough, a technician can go down uh, and check the equipment uh, and um, yeah, do some work here. But like they need to get approval. Uh, so yeah, it's um, it's uh, yeah we have to make sure that you know like, it's safe enough for us to go down. Yeah. Um, so maybe yeah. I just add to that that we have a, a a team that measures the radiation in the cavern, and so when the teams are coming down who want to work on part of the detectors they're certifying that it's safe because it is very radioactive when it's running and then when it stops running that radiation stops being produced yeah. but you know there's a little bit of residual for a little while in the yeah. cavern so but it can be and don't quote me on this because I'm not part of the team that does that safety measurement mm -hmm. but it can be as little as an hour before it's safe for people to come into yeah. the cavern so it does go away very quickly um, it just depends on which part of the detector. Yeah. Um, but yeah, do you want to tell them what we had to do to get into the cavern? So if anyone's seen Angels and Demons, then yeah. the part of the, that part of the movie, most of it is not true, but there's one part that is true. Which is like scanning the iris and it's, it's usually painful, you know, it's not that easy. So in order to get down, then uh, first of all, we need to uh, get like uh, the form, like electric form approved by the safety team. And usually it's done like 24 hours in advance. And uh, once it's done, then uh, we can scan our iris and then the machine can read the iris um, to tell like, whether it's us or not. And we have to use our dosimeters as well like, to, uh, in order to get down. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like, even say, if the bad guy want to steal our iris, oh, that it doesn't work. work. Yeah, 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 yeah. Work. <laughs> yeah. Just to make it very clear, you cannot take someone's eye out and use an iris scanner. That bit's false because you need the blood vessels. So the eye has to be in the head just to, you know, yeah. that part of the film is wrong. <laughs> yeah. But in addition to radiation, we also have like some risk with the magnetic field here. So sometimes we can still go um, up to the cavern, like, you know, when the, uh, the magnets are still on. And of course, like it's safe enough, but you can still feel the effect. So once I came down here and also do the virtual visit like this with the phone, and I could see that like the, the screen was a bit distorted. And if you bring down a compass, you could see that the compass is moving. Yeah, yeah. so um, the magnetic field is still, you know, like on. Maybe it's not negligible, um, uh, but yeah, like there's some risk with that. So basically people with like the pacemaker, 
the children go down here. Uh, pregnant women, uh, children under 16 years old. So here we take safety standards to a very, very high level, very seriously. Yeah. yeah. Also, when the magnet is on, don't bring credit cards down because then they won't work again. Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, brilliant. So, but and we also have a team that's monitoring all the time uh, the cavern to make sure that uh, because we're also underground and there's yeah. always like people who work in mines will know that there's always safety aspects of being underground. That's why we've got our hard helmets on and our fancy shoes uh, to protect our feet. Um, okay, anything more we want to say about the top of the detector? I mean, it's very cool to, to yeah, look down. Yeah, it's a very down. good view. Yeah. Anyone who's concerned about my camera being over the edge, I'm holding the handle. <laughs> I am not dropping this. Also, I believe that there's another reason why, a very good reason why we should leave our detector like 100 meter underground, right? Yeah. Because we want to shield ourselves from the cosmic rays. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like here we also do like calibration for the cosmic rays every now and then. Uh, but, uh, you know, like uh, the cosmic ray effect, like, you know, it's not like negligible. And um, yeah, so if you want to study cosmic rays, so you can put the detector 3000 meter on top of a mountain. But if you want to study the particles born from the collision in the laboratory, so we should just show ourselves and like put the detector 100 meters uh, on the ground like this. Um, so cosmic ray, where do they come from? So let's say, for example, like the muons uh, here that we just talked about, like the muon detectors. So they are born from uh, basically a cosmic ray that come from outer space, so usually like from the sun or from outer solar system. So they arrive at the Earth and interact with the upper atmosphere. So um, the muons are born and they travel a very long way from the upper atmosphere to the sea level where we are. The reason is because they interact very weakly with matter, so they can just like pass by many layers of matter. And this is also one of the reasons why we need to put our muon detector at the outermost layer instead of like being inside. And we need to have um, a special detector for muon um, analysis. Yeah. yeah. So that's actually really interesting because right now we're actually getting less radiation than we would have gotten on the surface because we are protected from some of those cosmic rays uh, while we're here in the cavern. But what we do do is when the, um, when the LHC is off, so when the Large Hadron Collider isn't colliding, uh, and not right now because there are people working on the detector, but other points, we turn our detector on and we measure these cosmic rays coming from the, the atmosphere from above us and they're passing very nicely through our detector in a very straight line, and it allows us to calibrate and also to fine tune where the position of each subcomponent of the detector is, because you'll get this nice charged particle passing through. The detector will read out a signal, um, but we know that it should be traveling in about a straight line, so it helps us to calibrate our detector. So we actually measured over a billion cosmic ray events last year, um, which really helps us to, to precisely understand our detector. So they are annoying. We do have to get rid of them in our uh, algorithms when we're doing our measurements, but at other points they can be really useful and they help us uh, with the precision studies that we're doing here at CERN. Um, so one thing I, I think we should do is if we go back to the sixth floor or the eighth floor, that's my favorite platform. Yeah. Um, and then we should talk more about the particles, because that's the one thing that we haven't really focused on yet, is uh, what we're trying to measure here at CERN and what we're looking for in the future. So sure. we'll, we can talk about that on the way uh, once we get down. But sure. uh, anything else you wanted to say? Not about really. This? Yeah, you can just show the view and then we can go down. Yeah. yeah. I but really enjoy the view from the top. I think that, you know, like through the screen, it's hard to tell how big the detector is. Yeah. But sometimes, like when there's someone walking past, then you can see the different, you know, like the scale, like using the scale of human, do you see like how big the detector is? Yeah. It's Let's really just say big. this magnet, I could not hug. It's too big. I could not put my arms around that. Uh, it's like a tree. I don't know if that helps with size. Also, in terms of weight, like the, um, the Torino markets, they are 20% of the entire detector. 
And I think that like it is, um, it is our pride, right? Like the toroidal magnet. Yeah. So Atlas stands for a LXC toroidal magnet. So like it distinguishes us from CMS, the um, uh, compact neon solenoid. Yeah. So I, I often, like, whenever I uh, introduce Atlas, I say that this is how Atlas is different from CMS, and I'm very proud of this magnet. Yeah. 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 We love it so much. We put it in the name, as you just yeah. said. So yeah, maybe quickly you could tell us uh, why do we have two detectors? Why is there Atlas and CMS? Because for people that don't know, we have these two general purpose detectors. Mm -hmm. So they're measuring everything that comes from the collision. We also have two other main uh, detectors on the Large Hadron Collider and a number of other amazing experiments here at CERN. But why do we have Atlas and CMS if they're trying to measure the same thing? Yeah, so first of all, like the, uh, the design of the two detectors are completely different. You can also see that they look different as well. So let's say that CMS is a lot smaller uh, compared to Atlas. And um, however, it is twice the mass of Atlas. So Atlas is about 7,000 mm -hmm. tons and CMS uh, is about 14,000. And wow, it's double actually. Yeah, it's, know that. it's double. Yeah, okay, it's yeah. double. And uh, yeah, but the size is a lot smaller. So that, this is why, like in the in the name, it's called like compact neon solenoid. Yeah, that's although, the thing they're most proud of. Yeah. <laughs> we love our, our magnet. They love the fact that they're very compact. Yeah, so like <laughs> we are, we are proud of our size, and they are proud of, like you know how compact this, um, you know how compact the, the detector is. Uh, so the the design is already very different. You know, like everything look completely different, and CMS is also very beautiful as well. And we need to design like a two separate experiment, like completely different, completely different method, and also we do our analysis completely independent from each other. So basically, it's like we look at the same thing from different angles, and it's very important in science because you know, like when something confirms like our theory right we easily you know like get the bias that like okay we do it um, right we get exactly what we expect and like Feynman say that like we are the easiest to just fool ourselves yeah yeah so um, it's better to have like two different experiments doing uh, like separately independently and at some point we also combine our result as well right so maybe you can talk about like the top um, analysis combination between Atlas and CMS. Yeah. So we have like a very healthy competition between Atlas and CMS. Of course, like we compete with each other, but we also collaborate with each other as well. Yeah. Yeah, those are really great examples. So yeah, to be able to discover the Higgs boson, for example, we uh, had to be able to have two, oh, I was trying to turn the camera around, have two sort of independent, well, exactly independent measurements. Uh, the collisions are separate, so the LHC can collide in Atlas and CMS at the same time. The accelerator teams are uh, fantastic at being able to um, control their beam, make it very, uh, very dense so that we get lots of collisions, and then also be able to collide in these multiple detectors at the same time. Um, but then when, once we've done our sort of independent measurements and we're very confident with those and we've compared them, then as Joni was saying, we can combine our results to get an even more statistically uh, strong measurement because we really need as much data as possible for some of these measurements, uh, the very rare ones. So the one that you mentioned was this top mass result. Yeah. So we combined all of the results from the Atlas and CMS uh, collaborations from run one, which was the first three years of data taking and then just got this really precise measurement of the mass at the top. And this is really useful not only as a precision measurement, but also input for um, some of the theoretical aspects that we're wanting to study as well. So yeah, like I think we yeah, can, sure. uh, we'll go back down to the one of the middle floors sure. yeah. and then uh, we can talk a bit more about the particles yeah. and the what we're looking for in the future. And we'll be able to answer a couple more questions and then we will have to sign off afterwards because we have a limited time in the cavern um, to be able to be down here. Also, it is Friday afternoon, so that is the end of the week. Not for everyone, there are some teams that are working over the weekend, but mostly when the LHC is off, we have a much more standard week. But when the Large Hadron Collider is on, then we are running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, to, to get all of that data. So people work in shifts and uh, 
collect as much data. Um, Do you want to oh, go to six, six, six? Yeah, six. six. Yeah. So let's just, uh, you can really see very close up. So this is part of the muon spectrometer, so we're at the back of it now. Um, yeah. And these are tubes that are used It's the for, muon drift tube. Yeah, the drift yeah. tube. Do you, do you work on the muons? Uh, no, not exactly right now. Um, so back then I did work on muons, but uh, different things. So I would say that like, I started um, with atomic physics and mm -hmm. I also used muon in yeah. my um, analysis, in my, in my study as well. So basically I study that like, new muonic uh, hydrogen. So ah. like, instead, yeah, instead of like having the electrons, so muon is like the big system uh, of electrons, so they are very similar. And instead of like having uh, an electron inside the uh, hydrogen atom, so we replace them with a muon and then like try to understand the, the spectrum of it. This is why I really love the muon. So basically like it's been with me like throughout my study and uh, yeah so this is the muon drip tube and inside is filled with gas and when you know like very similar to the, the idea of the silicon uh, sensor so inside this is is filled with gas and when a muon pass through then basically like it ionizes the gas and create an electric signal and uh, then there would be like the cables here, they, um, they get the signal, they bring the signal to the computers and then like we can save the data. So we can, this is how we detect the muons uh, from the uh, muon spectrometer. Yeah, and those sort of copper looking sections on the other side. So this is more for posi position measurement. So you see, we've got a lot of these tubes. And then the copper section on the other side is mostly focusing on uh, the timing because we want to know exactly when these muons have arrived. So that's really useful information as well. And some of the upgrades that we're doing, so the detector is not, I mean, it's finished, we've been using it, um, but it does get damaged from all of the radiation passing through it. And the, the LHC, the accelerator teams are so fantastic that they've been providing us with so much data. So this means a lot of particles passing through. And so the detectors get worn over time. Thank you. And so we are also designing upgrades for the detector. So new components that will be installed in a few years time. So uh, not that part, not the muon spectrometer, but the inner detector is going to get completely removed. So when I was asking Joni about working on the muons, I worked on the inner detector, specifically on the pixel detector. That's the part that I worked on for my PhD. Um, and it's, it's been installed and it's taking data and that's fantastic, but in a few years time it is going to come out uh, and be replaced with an entirely new section of inner detector which is going to be more resistant to radiation, it's going to give us more precise measurements of the position, um, and that's just really going to help us with our measurements. And we're also going to install uh, a new type of detector that's going to help us with the timing as well. So we never stop, uh, we're always designing new parts. And I think somebody asked a very long time ago, sorry, I glanced at the question when it went past, was how long does it take uh, to build and design these components? And we've been designing the upgrade already for the last sort of 10 years, and it's gonna go in, be installed in, in about three or four years time. I think I've got, I, we're in a new year now, so maybe in three years time. Um, and so that, I mean, it's about 15 years from, from design starting to then finally being installed and commissioned and running in the detector. So it's a long process. We have to plan these things very far in advance. Uh, and we do lots of tests along the way. These are custom designed hardware um, that we're building here. It's not, most of it is not off the shelf. Some of the stuff we can take, like some of the computing uh, facilities, we can sort of buy that, but the hardware, is custom, the algorithms. We've been contributing to machine learning work for the last 20 years. It's part of particle physics. Um, so we've really also been, a lot of my colleagues that have done work here at CERN have then gone on to uh, contribute to data science and startups and other uh, jobs as well. So some people stay here for a long time and some people learn a lot about the data processing and then, and then move on to, to other things. Um, so maybe we can, uh, yeah, if we come over here. So the one thing we didn't really talk about, and we should probably um, <laughs> mention a bit more before we finish the live, is uh, about the, we, we talked about how we measured the particles, we talked about how the detector works, we talked about the LHC and a lot of that, but what are we, what are we really measuring? Uh, why, why are we doing these studies? Um, 
carrot, Sun. I mean, I can take it as well, but if you want to yeah, explain. Okay, I mean, I can. So the, the big story that we had, let's see if, that's a bit dark, okay. The big story that we had uh, in the last uh, sort of 10 years was the discovery of the Higgs boson. So there was a lot of talk about this when the Large Hadron Collider was being switched on and uh, we'd gotten to the point in the, the physics it had been proposed by theorists over 60 years ago uh, to explain how elementary particles get mass. And we had gotten to the point with the Large Hadron Collider that we would either discover this new particle or we would be able to rule it out completely and that would be even more interesting in some ways. And so when the Large Hadron Collider turned on, we very quickly, I mean, it was a lot of work, but the teams worked fantastically well in being able to um, collect the data, calibrate it, understand it, do the selections. And so by 2012, we could announce to the world, Atlas and CMS had discovered this brand new elementary particle that was part of the field that gave elementary particles mass, which was a huge achievement. Um, but it's not the only story of the Large Hadron Collider. There are many other particles that we're studying and it doesn't just stop when you discover one. You want to measure their properties as precisely as possible. So the next steps with the Higgs boson, for example, is we have these generations of particles. So as was mentioned before, we have the electron and the muon. These are in different generations. And as we go up, higher in the generations, they get more massive. And we actually don't know why. We don't know why the muon is more massive than the electron. Otherwise, it has exactly the same properties, but it's more massive. And then we also have the tau, which is even more massive. And so it's from the interaction with the Higgs field that these particles get mass, but we have to verify that. So we have to show the Higgs boson interacting with these particles and at the rates that we expect from the theory. So these are some of the precision measurements that we do. We're also measuring the top quark. That's my favorite one because that's the, the group that I work in. Um, and we're exploring for, for new particles. So do you want to talk maybe a little bit about uh, the searches that we do? Just generally, I, I don't know if uh, with the uh, dark I matter. I don't work, I don't really work with uh, searches. So mostly I do with like precision measurement. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, I think that it, it's really boring because like I'm just like basically like repeating like what uh, we have done, like what other people have done, and maybe like with better techniques, better methods, and so on. But then I came to realize that it's very important for the searches because um, basically like with all the calibration that we're using, so we use like you know like all techniques, and we do the you know like um, the precision measurement, so that uh, from there we can realize basically like whether we have like new physics or not so if some of our measurement doesn't match with the theory then we can make a conclusion either that something is wrong with our method with our measurement or this new physics or the, you know something new and um, yeah this is why it's important and this is also why like, I really like uh, the muons because like basically like we use muons a lot in our uh, precision measurement and I'm also really like to talk about also like the W and the Z boson. Mm -hmm. It's not just because I'm working with the W and Z measurement, but it's, it's because like they are like the benchmark for us to move on, right? And um, for example, uh, you know, to move forward. So for example, like the Higgs boson, so they can decay into um, two Z bosons and they're like four electrons, right? Like electron and uh, muons and form uh, the signal of like the two muons, as Clara said earlier, that they make a very clear, straight lines, and then we can use those as um, the way to you know like measure the Higgs boson. Um, it's, it's a very clear signal, and from there, basically, we need a very good precision measurement for um, not only you know like the discovery of the Higgs, but also you know like the properties of the Higgs. Um, uh, and other searches as well. So we need precision measurement as, you know, like the benchmark, as the base for the future. So, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I think, yeah, precision measurements are so important and it's, it's really what we, I would say is our bread and butter here at CERN is doing these measurements and understanding what we've already discovered. And then on top of that, we also have teams who are doing fantastic searches looking for different types of particles. Um, there was a big effort, uh, and there still is some effort, but 
uh, for looking for supersymmetry, which I, I don't have time to go into now, but is, uh, is a hypothesized set of new particles. Unfortunately, they didn't show up so far in the detector, but there are ways that they yeah. could still show up. But now we're starting to challenge ourselves because we know that there is other physics processes yeah. out there. We know that there is dark matter in our universe that we cannot yet explain what it's made of. We know that antimatter um, exists in our universe and from our understanding, it should have been produced in equal amounts in the early universe. But when it meets with antimatter, it annihilates. So why is there matter left over? This is also one of the big questions we have. Um, I think I mentioned briefly earlier about neutrinos. We, we don't, um, we don't know how they get their mass. We don't think that they interact with the Higgs field in order to get their mass uh, that way. So there must be some other ways because we know that neutrinos have mass. This has been uh, observed from them oscillating and changing into each other. And there's a number of other big questions as well. Um, we want to understand the early universe. So ALICE, which is one of the other experiments here at CERN, is looking at the very early universe. Uh, well is recreating conditions similar to the early universe in, in terms of the quark gluon plasma um, and, and enables us to then study how that evolves. LHCB is really focusing on this antimatter um, question, but then also looking for, well, doing lots of other measurements and discoveries as well. And so th this is what keeps us really busy as, as well here at CERN. We're trying to look for new particles and new ways that they could be showing up in our detector, which challenges us to write new algorithms. One of the big questions is maybe if dark matter doesn't, um, doesn't change into other particles straight away, if it exists as a particle, maybe it travels a bit through the detector first. And so now we're, we're having these algorithms that looks for particles. Let me turn my camera around. So rather than them being created right in the very heart of the detector over there, maybe they travel a bit first and then they change into other particles over here. And so we have to change our algorithms completely to, to think of it in a different way. So we're really trying to use the data as broadly as possible to do these precision measurements, to look for new particles, to try and understand what dark matter is and just see what else is out there uh, in the, uh, the subatomic world. And finally, I would like to say that um, in addition to like, all the physics uh, that we are doing, um, there are also a lot of work being done on the hardware and the software like for R&D, and they are very important. So just imagine that like with all the technology that we are doing, for example, let's say the silicon sensor, who knows like how like our phone could become in the next five, 10 years, 20 years, like they could, there could be like a huge improvement on the performance of our phones, right? And um, also like with the magnet, so we have been constantly um, doing a lot of R&D on the magnet to, uh, to improve the performance of our magnet, um, superconducting magnet to be precise. And this technology can be applied a lot in real life, for example, like the MRI. Um, and uh, we can also use this for uh, the Mark left the magnetic levitation trains and many further application in the futures. So uh, yeah, so alongside with all the physics research, we also want to. Uh, so we also work. So we have been working on the application, and you know, like uh, to uh, to be applied in the, um, like uh, in uh, industry and also uh, in medical research and many more fields. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there's so much that comes from this technology uh, and what we're doing here at CERN. So it's it's definitely past our time. We've uh, we've gone a bit over. So um, thank you so much for staying with us. I, I think we're going to have to close up here. So we really didn't manage to get to, to many of the questions in the chat. So it will be saved afterwards. So I'm going to go through and try and see what I can answer from the chat. But if you didn't get your question answered or perhaps you're joining later, so uh, welcome from the future then uh, please stick your comments and your questions down in the actual comments section uh, and I'll try and come back to those later and see how many we can get answered from there. Uh, but it's been really great to have you with us. Uh, I've really enjoyed this tour with you. I've been reading your comments as we've been going through uh, and it's been really wonderful uh, to, to see you discussing and to see you really enjoying this tour. So uh, I'm going to is there anything else you want to say before we close or I mean we, there's so much more we could have talked yes, about as course, well. Yeah. But, uh, 
I yeah, it's covered really most my of. pleasure to be with Clara and to be with you to share the passion for physics, for science and exploration. And I hope to get many more on board with us. And especially, you know, like two young girls, I want to tell you that, you know, science and technology is for everyone, not for just boys, you know, like it's for everyone, really everyone. Yeah. Wonderful. So brilliant. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, we're going to close the live here. Uh, I'm going to leave you with just a final look of this amazing detector because uh, it's just, I will come and look at this detector as much as I possibly can because I love it so much. So yeah, if you do come to Geneva, come and check out our brand new science gateway. Uh, we have a new museum that's completely free to, to view. Um, so we explain a lot of the concepts about CERN there as well. And uh, we do tours every day but Monday. So it's not always possible to come under de underground. I just want to uh, make that one very clear because the spots underground are very limited. But we do have fantastic tours above ground. You can visit the control room of Atlas. You can visit the antimatter factory. You can visit the first accelerator ever built at CERN. Um, and this is all completely free because, uh, you know, this is already, this is an international project and open for everyone. So, okay, yeah. Thanks so much for joining. Okay, bye.